The title of my message this morning is Surely I Will Be With You. And the sermon scripture is from Judges 6, verses 11 through 16. Thank you, Deaconess Dallas, my buddy. My key verse is verse 16. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. God is omnipresent. He is everywhere present all the time. God is omniscient, all-knowing, and all-understanding. God is omnipotent. He is all-powerful. And God is all-good. By contrast, man in and of himself is limited and lacking, uninformed and ill-informed, frail and impoverished, and man is sinful. And yet, our awesome God desires to be with us because he created us to be in relationship with him. Despite mankind's fall into sin, God's holy word promises and shows that he is indeed still with us. And for those who accept Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and are obedient to God, he sends his Holy Spirit to live in us. So God is in us and with us. You would be familiar with the word Emmanuel. We hear it and use it during the Christmas season all the time. Emmanuel comes from the two Hebrew words, Imanu, which means with us, and El, which means God. So hence, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God with us. The actual word Emmanuel appears only four times in the Bible, three times in the Old Testament, in the book of Isaiah, and once in the New Testament, in the Gospel of Matthew. It appears first in Isaiah chapter 7. Ahaz, who was king of the southern kingdom of Judah, was living in fear because the neighboring land of Syria was seeking to destroy him and his people. But God, through the prophet Isaiah, tells Ahaz, take heed and be quiet. Fear not, it shall not stand, neither shall it come to pass. Isaiah goes on to say in Isaiah chapter seven, verse 14, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. God would give a sign that would demonstrate that he was with his people. In the New Testament, Emmanuel, of course, is one of the names or titles for Jesus. In his gospel, Matthew draws from this prophecy in Isaiah 7 when the announcement of the birth of Jesus is made. Matthew 1, 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. We now see the prophecy in its fuller, ultimate purpose and promise fulfilled. Jesus, Emmanuel, is God. God incarnate. God in the flesh. God with us. There are many examples in the Bible 
of God's promise to be with his people. God with us is the embodiment of his promise to all who would put their faith and trust in him. When God commissioned Moses to deliver the Hebrews out of bondage in Egypt, he said to Moses in Exodus 3, 12, certainly I will be with thee. In Joshua 1, 5, when he appoints Joshua to succeed Moses and lead the Israelites into the promised land, God says to Joshua, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. And in Joshua 1, 9, be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. And of course, we have the promise from Jesus himself when he gave the Great Commission. Matthew 28, 20. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. One of my most powerful spiritual experiences of feeling the presence of God was back in 2000. I was preparing for my oral board certification examination in obstetrics and gynecology. This was truly one of the most stressful times of my life. I'm usually a very confident person, very sure of myself and my abilities, particularly when it comes to taking an academic test, an examination. But for some reason, at that time, I really felt like I was losing my mind. My self-confidence was at an all-time low, and I was just so afraid and full of doubt. I had to travel to Texas to sit the oral exam, and I had gone up several days early to take a preparatory course. When the preparatory course, when I took it, it made me feel like I knew absolutely nothing. Each night in my hotel room, I prayed and I read my Bible and I beseeched God to please help me. Every day, I, I felt like I was on the edge of an emotional precipice, ready to fall over. But I kept praying. I kept praying. And then, the night before the exam, as I lay on the hotel bed, groaning, with my Bible on my chest, I suddenly felt the overwhelming but peaceful and reassuring presence of the Holy Spirit. And all my fears and my doubts just literally disappeared. I knew it was God who had just laid his hand on me. The next day, as I traveled to the examination center, I was calm, knowing that the Lord was with me, Emmanuel. As I set the examination, I was confident, knowledgeable, and fearless. <laughs> when I finished the exam, when it was finished, I just knew with godly confidence that I had passed and that all was well. A few short weeks later, I received the confirmation that I was now a board certified obstetrician gynecologist. Emmanuel. Yes, hallelujah. Today's sermonic text comes from the book of Judges. Judges tells the story of Israel's early leaders who were called Judges. The book recounts the cycles of Israel's relationship with God. There is a distinct pattern that is evident. The Israelites experience God's blessings. 
they then fall into a period of spiritual complacency and they lapse into sin and rebellion against God. God then brings judgment upon them through foreign oppression and suffering at the hands of enemies. The people then cry out to God for help. God sends deliverance through one of the judges. Today's text, Judges 6, verses 11 through 16, deals with the time when Gideon is chosen to deliver Israel out from under the oppression of the Midianites. The six short verses of today's text beautifully illustrate and encapsulate God's promise to be with us. But the text also touches on our duty as God's people. This is not a one-sided relationship. With blessings comes responsibility. So come with me now as we explore the calling of Gideon as we cover the following three points. Point number one, in the midst of oppression and doubt, the Lord will come to thee if. Point number two, into the midst of conflict, the Lord will send thee, go. And point number three, in the midst, surely the Lord is with thee, Emmanuel. Point number one, in the midst of oppression and doubt, the Lord will come to thee, if. In Judges 6, verses 1 to 10, the verses preceding today's text, we read of how the Israelites sinned against God. They disobeyed him and worshipped false gods, doing evil in the sight of the Lord. God therefore turns the Israelites over to oppression at the hands of the Midianites. The Midianites regularly raided Israel's crops and livestock, leaving the people poor, vulnerable, and at risk of starvation. The Israelites resorted to hiding themselves and their food in the caves of the mountains. After seven long years of this oppression, the Israelites finally cry out to God for help. God first sends an unnamed prophet to deliver a message. He first reminds the people that he was the one who freed them from bondage in Egypt. He was the one who gave them the promised land. And he reminds them that they had disobeyed him. Then our merciful God sends deliverance. Today's text picks up the story at this point. Verses 11 and 12. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak, which was in Ophrah, that pertained unto Joash the Abirzrite. And his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Let's first note this picture of the oppression under which the Israelites were living. Gideon is threshing wheat by the winepress. Thresh from the Hebrew word havat, meaning to beat out or beat down. The threshing of wheat is a process that involves beating or crushing the harvested stalks of wheat to separate the grain from the inedible parts. The process was done in a large, flat, open space called a threshing floor. 
And yet here, Gideon is doing it in a wine press. The wine press was the area where the grapes were pressed. It was usually a limestone tank or trough that was cut into the rock or vats sunk into the ground. And there was often a wooden structure surrounding and covering the wine press. Gideon is forced to work, to thresh wheat in this inconvenient, confined place. The ignominy, the disgrace, and shame of this situation is twofold. Firstly, the threshing of wheat is symbolic of the beatdown, the crushing that the Israelites are being subjected to. And secondly, Gideon has been reduced to the pitiful position of hiding out in a wine press to keep the food hidden from the Midianites. The only way Israel could hope to hold on to any of their crops was to keep them hidden from the Midianite raiders. So instead of doing his work out in the open, Gideon was hiding because of the oppression of the Midianites. Just look at where sin, disobedience, had led. Because of their sin and rebellion against God, God's chosen people are living a life of hardship and fear and oppression. Because of their disobedience, they are operating in and walking in defeat. And not only that, but the people also now actually doubt the saving power and mercy of God. In verse 13, Gideon says, Oh, my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us about, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us unto the hands of the Midianites. Oh, but God, despite their doubt, the people do cry out to God, and God responds. The angel of the Lord appears to Gideon. Psalm 145, verse 18 the Lord is nigh unto all them that call upon him, to all that call upon him in truth. Now let's also note that when the angel of the Lord appears to Gideon, he calls Gideon, thou mighty man of valor. A man of valor is one who displays great courage and bravery in the face of danger, especially in battle. In the Old Testament, the term man of valor was usually applied to soldiers like Joshua, generals like Naaman, warrior kings like David. But here, the term is applied to a man doing servant's work and hiding out in caves. Bibleref.com says, and I quote, the angel's lofty description of Gideon expresses a reality yet unseen and so obscured from the human perspective. The angel of the Lord addresses Gideon as he soon will be not as he is in the moment. God speaks of what he knows, not of what fallible people see, unquote. God knows your future potential, and he can speak to it because he has designed it, and he is in control of it. 
God will appoint you and anoint you to do great things in his name and according to his will. So in the midst of oppression and doubt, obscurity and insecurity, the Lord will come to thee. When we sincerely repent, God responds. He will come to you and meet you at your point of need. If you call out to him, if you repent. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, the Lord is with thee. Many biblical scholars believe that here, the angel of the Lord was actually a theophany. A theophany was the manifestation of the second person of the Godhead, God the Son, in visible bodily form before his incarnation in the New Testament at Bethlehem. This theophany was the pre-incarnate Jesus. The word theophany comes from two Greek words, theos, meaning God, and phaneros, meaning appearance, visible. Theophany was one of the many ways God chose to reveal himself and his message to mankind. This appearance here of the angel of the Lord actually being a theophany, the visible manifestation of God, is further alluded to in verse 14, where he is now just referred to as the Lord. Not the angel of, just the Lord. The original Hebrew text, the original language says, Yahuwah, Yahuwah. Jehovah. This is the same terminology, the name that is reserved for God alone. God appeared to Gideon. We have other instances of theophany in the Bible. A couple of examples from the book of Genesis. Genesis 17, 1. And when Abram was 90 years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. And we read in Genesis 26, verses 1 to 3. And there was a famine in the land. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go, not down into Egypt. Dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee. Once God has responded to your cry unto him and has come to you in your repentance, he will now empower you to conquer the enemy. And you will now be accountable to do the will of God. Which takes me to point number two. Point number two, into the midst of conflict, the Lord will send thee. Go. Verses 14 and 15. And the Lord looked upon him and said, Go in this thy might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O oh my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. God responds to the plight of the Israelites and to the individual and collective doubt by appointing Gideon to deliver them. Gideon, however, 
does not think himself capable of or worthy of the assigned task. He says that his family is the poorest and least influential of his tribe and that he himself is the least important in his family. Is this not typical of how society still thinks today? A person is judged worthy or not, or capable or not, based on their social standing or their financial status or even their physical appearance. And so we limit ourselves and we allow others to put limits on us. We exist in fear and doubt because of these perceived deficiencies, these man-made labels. Oh, but God. First Samuel 16, 7 tells us, For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. God isn't interested in how the world sees us. God looks into the heart to see whether we are in right relationship with him. And when we are, it is then that he can use us to accomplish his purposes. When you are in right relationship with God, he will call you and then he will send you. And because God sends you, he will prepare you and equip you. Go in this thy might. Have not I sent thee? God is telling Gideon that he has everything he needs to accomplish the task in front of him because God is sending him and God is with him. Gideon's might might be weak, but God's might, God's strength is perfected in our weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. God will equip you for the task that he calls you and sends you to do. You know, I still find it somewhat intimidating whenever I am called to preach, but I trust my pastor because I know that she trusts God and is obedient to him. So whenever I am called to preach and I'm preparing my message, I remember what Pastor Seaman instructed in the preachers in training class. Listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit. He will speak to you and guide you. And so every time, as much as I might stress about preparing my message, the Holy Spirit gives it to me. So God tells Gideon to go. I have a task for you. And oh, what a task it is. And thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. Gideon has been commissioned to do nothing less than to save an entire nation, to save Israel. Save, from the Hebrew word, yasa, to liberate, to deliver, to save from moral troubles. When I read these two verses, verses 14 and 15, I see a metaphor of, or a precursor to, if you will, the Great Commission. In Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, Jesus says to the disciples, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, 
teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And in Mark 16, verses 15 and 16, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world, and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. The Great Commission is the instruction of Jesus Christ to his disciples to spread the gospel to all nations of the world. We are to witness to the saving power of the death and resurrection of Jesus, the saving power of the blood of Jesus. We are to let people know that the only way to eternal life is through belief in and obedience to Jesus, our resurrected Savior. In the original language of the scripture, the Great Commission is a command. It's not a suggestion. In the words of James Hudson Taylor, who was a British Protestant missionary to China, the Great Commission is not an option to consider, it is a command to be obeyed. Gideon is commanded, go save Israel. Into the midst of conflict, the Lord will send thee. Go. Today, our world is becoming increasingly dark. Immorality and amorality and sin are running rampant. We must be contenders for the faith. We must win souls to the kingdom so that they can be saved. We must march and pray on the sidewalks of Front Street. We must stand and pray on the steps of Parliament. And though we might be afraid, we must be brave. We must go, for the Lord is with us. Isaiah 41, verse 10, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. We must be contenders for the righteousness of God, believing he is with us. Indeed, in Matthew 28, 20, Jesus completes his instruction of the Great Commission by saying, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. And this takes me to my third point. Point number three, in the midst, surely the Lord is with thee, Emmanuel. The final verse of today's text, verse 16, and the Lord said unto him, surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Israel has cried out to God for deliverance from the oppression of the Midianites. The Lord responds and appoints Gideon to save them. In his human weakness, Gideon replies with fear and doubt, Oh, but God. The Lord emphatically reassures Gideon, Surely 
I will be with thee. Surely, from the Hebrew, kai, meaning indeed, certainly, doubtless. God would change Gideon's doubt to doubtless. He lets Gideon know that victory is certain because he will be in the midst. Emmanuel, God with us. For if God be with us, who can stand against us? The Israelites would go from living a life of oppression, fear, and doubt to one where they are walking in victory. When God says, thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man, this can be interpreted in two ways. Firstly, the victory over the Midianites will be clear, convincing, and complete. Gideon would defeat every single last Midianite down to the last man. No one would be left standing. The second interpretation of as one man is that God meant Israel would rally behind Gideon and they would fight in unity, in cooperation as one. I like both interpretations, but I'm really partial to the second. It speaks to how we, as God's people, should be one body in Christ, operating in and walking in unity, victory indeed. And when we operate in unity, when we gather together cooperatively and corporately to worship God in truth and praise him and thank him for his goodness and his mercy, just to thank him for who he is, we know that his Holy Spirit will surely be in the midst. Emmanuel. Jesus gave us this reassurance and promise. 14, 16 to 17. And I will pray the Father, and he shall give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it sees him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you and shall be in you. So we see God has always been with his people. For the Lord your God goes with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. In the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Jesus, was amongst us. In the New Testament, the incarnate Jesus, the Messiah, our Savior, was in our midst. When he returned to glory, he sent the third person of the Holy Trinity, God the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, to dwell amongst us and in us. The Holy Spirit is with us now during this, the age of grace. So, as God's people, we have never been alone. As I conclude, let me share with you the ultimate blessing. When this earth ceases to be and this time comes to an end, God's people will be with him for all eternity. My prayer is that if there is anyone present today or listening who has not 
accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior, that you would do so without delay. God's people will see him face to face. We will be surrounded by his glory. We will stand in his presence. God has given us his promise. Revelation 21 verse 3. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Surely I will be with you. Thank you, family. I pray you've been blessed.